All right. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, good afternoon to those of you in, in, in Europe. Good morning to those of you in the U.S. We have a transatlantic panel to talk about the two big to fail reforms um, suggested and acted by the FSB uh, and um, and the 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 results that they've seen since then, an analysis of the results that they've seen since then. Appropriately, we have with us the vice president of the Bundesbank, who is also the chair of the uh, Too Big to Fail um, analysis for the FSB, Professor Claudia Buch with us uh, today out of Germany. In the U.S., we have Richard Cantor. He's the chief credit officer of Moody's, and he'll be able to speak to his reaction to the findings of the paper that was recently released, um, as well as you know the market's reaction to um, the reforms and credit ratings agencies' important analysis as well. I've got a few uh, housekeeping items um, to clear up first. I'm Matt Miller. I anchor the European Market Open Show on Bloomberg Television. Um, you can watch my show on the continent, 8 to 10 a.m. every weekday morning in London, 7 to 9 a.m. and in the U.S., uh, you're probably up way too early if you're watching uh, my show or, or way too late. If you have any connection issues, uh, any connectivity issues with the um, with your uh, uh, web website, with the computer, with the internet, just go ahead and refresh. I'm sure you know that that's almost always the answer. So if you have connectivity issues, if we freeze up or something, you can re refresh um, your browser. And then I also want to point out that that Q&A is a really important part of these conferences, of this platform. So if you have any questions, regardless of uh, when it is in the conversation or the presentation, go ahead and submit those. You can use um, this platform to submit any questions and we'll try and get around to uh, them as uh, as soon as we possibly can, as soon as it's um, relevant in the conversation. And we really appreciate the interaction. The interactivity is a big part uh, of these uh, presentations of these webinars. Let me get now to Professor Claudia Buch. As I said, she's the vice president of the Bundesbank. Um, she has been on the German Council of Economic Experts, so advising um, Chancellor Merkel. And if you took economics at Magdeburg or at Tübingen, you may have had her as your professor. But right now she is chairing this TBTF, Too Big to Fail um, analysis. And uh, let's get first a brief presentation from her. Ms. Vice President. Yes, thank you very much, Matt. Can you hear me well? Is it okay? Can you hear me? Is the, is the connection stable? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks for um, for joining today. As has been said, it's a different times um, um, of of the day. And um, what I would like to talk about, and I'm I'm very um, glad that we have um, distinguished audience and and it is discussed, are the uh, results of the too big to fail evaluation of the um, uh, that the G20 leaders have agreed upon the too big to fail reforms after the global financial crisis. As Matt has said, the Financial Stability Board has really coordinated a large-scale um, project to look at the effects of the reforms um, 10 years after they have been decided upon, a few years after they've been implemented. And this is based on a framework that the FSB has developed um, three years ago, um, how in a very structured way to look at the effects of the reforms. So to understand what the effects of the reforms are and also to understand what potential um, unintended side effects are. But before going into the details and the findings of this uh, group, which is really a large scale effort across the G20 countries, let's just recall what the situation looked like more than 10 years ago. So we had banks which um, had much stronger capital, uh, much uh, weaker capital base um, than um, to, to today. We didn't really have resolution regimes for, for banks in case banks would fail and for that reason, very often taxpayers' money was used to bail out banks. And that was the dedicated um, goal of um, the G20 leaders to end that, to end too big to fail, and um, um, through higher capital requirements, through enhanced supervision, and also for new regimes for the recovery and resolution of banks. Now, the objective was to reduce moral hazard, to reduce um, systemic risk, and we all know that it's these are not things we can easily observe. Um, so what we had to do in this, um, in this evaluation project was to look at 
and to find indicators um, which we can then use to assess to what extent systemic risk and moral hazard have fallen. And by and large, um, we found that actually the reforms appear to be working. So we see first and foremost that the banks are much better capitalized. They've built up significant loss absorbing capacities, so-called TLAC or bail-in capital over and above the capital requirements. Um, and this just makes banks much more resilient. Um, the evaluation doesn't look into the effects of the corona pandemic, but obviously um, this has also been very beneficial going into the, into the current crisis that there were bigger buffers in the banking system. Now return on equity of banks, um, of the systemically important banks um, has fallen. And um, people may say, well, this is negative in terms of resilience. But it's actually to some extent an ex um, expected effect of the reforms because we um, see that the implicit funding subsidies that came through bailout um, of um, governments, um, that these implicit funding subsidies have been reduced. So we have higher capital, we have a reduction in implicit funding subsidies, we have less risk taking um, uh, by the systemically important banks and all this has an impact on return on equity, but it's actually um, in the end, making the banks and the banking system stronger. Um, we look very carefully into um, uh, resolution and resolution um, planning, and we actually found that feasibility of resolution has increased. So um, authorities now have many more instruments available, many more options to deal with banks in distress. And there's actually, for those of you who are interested, there's a resolution reform index that is published on the FSB website um, where you can look at the detailed evidence across um, countries. Now, legal resolution reforms, new legal frameworks are, are one issue, but to what extent um, are these reforms um, being seen as credible by market participants? We looked at a whole range of indicators and the report has um, all the details. And let me just give the, the overall message. The overall message is that um, implicit funding um, subsidies have tended to decline. So in some sense, the bank's funding costs now better reflect the probability of a bail-in. And we also find that these funding costs of the, the systemically important banks are more sensitive to, to risk. And there's actually also correlation between the resolution reforms, our resolution reform index, and changes in this um, funding cost. So the first finding um, indicators are pointing into the right direction, so the reforms are effective. The second key finding the too big to fail reforms bring net benefits to society. Um, so again, returning to the issue of funding cost, I've already um, explained that, of course, higher funding cost may be seen as something negative by the banks or by the by the bank's um, shareholders. But of course, they imply a lower cost for the taxpayer. And there are a lot of other issues where you could say, well, the private versus the um, public sector view um, of the effects of the reforms um, differs. We've taken a very careful look at a lot of indicators and we clearly see that on balance, not only do we have a more resilient banking system, but we also don't see any negative impacts on, for instance, lending on cross-border activities of banks. I'm sure we will have some more um, issues to, to discuss there. But um, for now, um, what we find here is that there are no um, uh, negative side effects um, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the aggregate. Um, the third finding to those of you who felt that this sounded a bit too optimistic, the third finding is actually, um, as we are learning how the new system is working, we also see where it can be improved. And let me just um, mention two things. I'm sure we'll um, find more time here to, to discuss these. One is um, that obviously resolution of banks is a very complex process. Um, so, and we do certainly see that some obstacles to resolvability um, remain to be in place. There's a lot of FSB work and also work at the national level um, in addressing these, these gaps. And um, there's also, as if you look at the resolution reform index, there are still countries, regions where full implementation of the resolution reforms um, has not been achieved yet and is, is therefore um, encouraged. We also find that there's a, a lot of areas where I think everybody, um, the, the institutions, markets, um, policymakers, also academics would benefit from better um, information. Um, we certainly have much more information now, but there's, um, there's um, additional um, gains we can make from um, improving re reporting and also dis disclosures.
Um, let me just very quickly say what I also mentioned earlier. We don't really look into the effects of the corona pandemic, so the, the empirical results uh, basically cover the, the period up until fe February this, this year. But of course, there's a lot of issues in terms of higher resilience, um, more options to deal with distressed banks, which are highly relevant for the uh, for the current um, situation. So that's why we decided to, to publish the report. Uh, we gave more time than usual for um, for feedback. So the consultation period is actually until September 30th. And we would be really grateful if many people who are listening now um, or may also spread words uh, to, to others, uh, give us feedback, give us res res responses to um, this evaluation. And then the plan is to, to publish the final report at the beginning of next year. Let me stop here and thanks a lot for, for listening. And we will talk um, certainly a lot in a lot more detail about many of those things. Uh, let me bring in right now Richard Cantor. He is the Chief Credit Officer for Moody's, has been since 2008. He's also served as uh, 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 the Chief Risk Officer um, for the decade from 2009 to 2019. And uh, since we're talking um, alma maters uh, of the sort, uh, if you studied at UCLA or the Ohio State University, you would have taken uh, classes possibly from Richard Cantor. Uh, Richard, why don't you tell us uh, the Moody's view on this? Thank you, Matt. Uh, good day, everyone. I'd like to thank the FSB for inviting me and giving me special reason to read its very interesting Too Big to Fail report. The report is much more than a stock take, uh, which would simply check progress against targeted reforms. Rather, it investigates whether the reforms have actually achieved the benefits that were originally proposed. The report's comprehensive. It includes a, a great uh, literature review, original research, uh, insights from interviews uh, with market participants. And the report's objective. Uh, it's informed by theory. Uh, it's grounded in data. It's it's qu quite clear-eyed and uh, well defended against uh, confirmation bias. So I really recommend it. Uh, overall, I agree with the report's conclusion that the <clears throat> available evidence supports the view that the too big to fail reforms have had a positive social impact. Almost all banks are better capitalized today than they were before the global financial crisis, and this is particularly true of global systemically important banks. Orderly resolution tools are now in place in most key uh, jurisdictions, and the resolution playbooks have been discussed by and are understood by bank management and their regulators. Uh, we at Moody's have been incorporating the credit implications of these developments into our ratings since the beginning of 2015. And subsequently, uh, we observed over time that investors have also developed a broad understanding of the resolution and recovery process. As far as we can tell, the reforms have not had harmful unintended consequences. Uh, risk taking by banks does not appear to have been increased. Uh, credit avail availability does not appear to have been curtailed. And the structure of the financial system does not appear to have been destabilized. However, as the report correctly points out, uh, these conclusions must be considered tentative, I would say for the following four reasons. It's impossible to directly measure the net social benefits of the reforms because the reforms were put in place gradually and were broadly anticipated by the market. So there are no clear dates around which to construct empirical uh, event studies. Uh, secondly, as a consequence, an indirect approach is required for measuring social impact. And yet there is no agreed upon methodology for making such inferences and different methodologies can reach different conclusions. Thirdly, uh, future bailouts remain a possibility. Uh, many banking systems are still in transition and more changes are still needed in some jurisdictions before the reformers can say, job done. And lastly, but most important, importantly, uh, the efficacy of a resolution and recovery plan has not yet been tested by the resolution of a global systemically important bank. So there's a lot we still don't know. As Claudia mentioned, the work of the underlying report, <coughs> the work underlying the report was concluded before the onset of the COVID-19 recession. In the current crisis, the banking system is seen as a relative source of strength for the global economy, due in large part to the capital buffers that were put in place after the financial crisis. Many bank, bank stocks, however, are currently down almost 40% from their pre-crisis peaks. But this sell-off is tied to weaker earnings prospects, not concerns about viability. 
There are, <clears throat> there is, of course, substantial risk that the recession will prove longer and deeper than currently projected, and the resilience of the financial system could be tested. If a banking crisis were to emerge, and if systemically important banks were at risk of failure, there would inevitably be pressure to use the resolution tools that have been put in place. At the same time, the public authorities in some jurisdictions might take a different view on bank resolution. Unlike the last crisis in which risk-taking by banks contributed to the crisis, banks are seen as passive victims of the COVID crisis, much like households and non-financial firms, both of which are benefiting from government support in many countries. In summary, the G20 asked the FSB to make tools available that could be used by policymakers to achieve orderly bank resolutions without the use of public funds. In addition, the FSB was tasked with ensuring that the market would find the resolution playbook sufficiently credible, that risks would be priced accordingly, and the moral hazard problems associated with too big to fail expectations would be reduced. I think the FSB has largely achieved these objectives and without incurring major adverse unintended consequences. There remains, however, considerable work to be done, particularly around delivering consistent implementation across all G20 jurisdictions and disclosing to the market more detail on the resolution plans for each global systemically important bank. I think we are well along the path to ending the presumption of too big to fail. But in the end, the decision to invoke the full suite of resolution tools or instead inject public funds will be a political decision and it will depend on the prevailing facts and circumstances. Thank you for listening. And at this point, I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Matt, Matt Miller here. Um, just wanna uh, quickly say for, for, the, for the ease of addressing each other, um, I'll just refer to you Richard Cantor is doctor. I know you did uh, your PhD, I think, at Johns Hopkins University. And um, uh, Claudia Buch, I'll just refer to you as professor. It's easier than, than VP. Um, as as uh, Dr. Cantor was just mentioning, you know, the, the reason this um, too big to fail problem um, was raised at, at G7 and G20 levels is that governments wanted to avoid another situation after the great financial crisis where there was no other choice but to bail out financial institutions with taxpayer money. In the 10 years, uh, 11 years since then, um, uh, Professor Buki, you've been able to enact some of these reforms. And I wonder, as we now enter what could be another financial crisis, are we, are we through with this problem? Are there no longer you know, um, entities that are too big to fail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously the key question that everybody's raising us at, at, at this juncture. From a very procedural point of view, let me say that we haven't really, as I said earlier, we haven't really studied the current situation. So the report wouldn't have anything to say on how should individual authorities, what choices should they um, take or doesn't make any specific policy recommendations. But let me try to answer that key question. So have we solved too big to fail, yes or no? Let me let me answer it in two ways. So I think we've ways I think we've solved it in the way that we've understood it. We know what policies have to be implemented, and we've um, we've come a long way in terms of implementation. Like I said before, there's work that remains to be to be done, but by and large, these reforms are being put into into place, and we're seeing that the system is moving into the right direction. Does that mean we have solved the issue in terms of there will never ever again in the future be a situation where um, the, the issue of state support to failing banks is coming into play? I think everybody around this virtual table would say no. So in that sense, I, I mean, we have to be alert. We have to understand, as I said, how the system is working in, in the current pandemic. I think we have to be uh, very careful um, and to also understand that it's a, it's a different shock that has hit the financial system than the global financial crisis. So I think the the first policy response to the to the COVID pandemic is really to make sure that um, the, the the real economy is protected from this shock. This is what a lot of governments around the globe have have, have done. So we have huge fiscal programs, and of course we are all very alert to understand how is the the situation evolving, to what extent is the financial system affected. So far, what we've seen in most places is that the um, financial system has been fairly resilient to this shock, so it continued to, to function. But that's also because we, we had all these other policies, uh, fiscal and monetary policy 
um, responses in, in place. So clearly what we can say about the current situation is we are much better pre prepared. Um, we, are much, we are much better able to, to deal with also stress in the financial system. But what exactly is going to, to happen in this, in this situation of fundamental uncertainty, I think nobody, nobody knows. Yeah, it's interesting because one of the questions, uh, one of the questions that we've gotten um, from participants, from from viewers uh, of this uh, platform, is whether or not we're going to see bailouts again, government bailouts again during um, COVID nineteen. We can talk more about that, but um, uh, Dr. Kanner, let me ask you about in your position at Foodies, and you've been there um, in charge in charge of the global. Um, uh, as chief credit officer since the great financial crisis, how has um, your approach to rating uh, to ratings changed, evolved throughout this too big to fail reform process? Thanks, Matt. Um, so prior to the uh, institution of the reforms, you know, we really only saw two outcomes uh, possible for a. a, a a systemically important bank. It would either be a bailout or an insolvency. And with an insolvency, you would have uh, a lot of systemic consequences. Uh, and in, in, in that regard, so we still thought it was quite possible that that would occur. So we didn't rate everybody AAA, uh, but we did um, think bailouts were, were highly likely for, for such institutions. And therefore, uh, we tended to rate uh, systemically important banks, you know, two to four notches higher then we would have rated them on their intrinsic uh, strengths alone. And uh, with regard to the various uh, liability instruments that they had, um, we didn't make very large distinctions. The span of ratings might go from you know, three notches from subordinated debt to deposit. And, and that reflected the fact that in insolvency, all liabilities might go through a period of default. And, and it wasn't entirely clear that the priority of claim would, would always be 100% respected. Uh, now, since the reforms were put in place, uh, you know, that's changed. Um, we do think uh, in, in, in regimes where we, uh, we believe that the toolkits are, are, are in place and, and we believe it's operational and we think the authorities are willing to use them in certain situations, we've changed our rating approach to reflect that. Um, I do think uh, if there is an idiosyncratic shock at a large financial institution, uh, they'll be very strong. Uh, desires to implement the resolution toolkit. Uh, in a systemic crisis, there, there may also be uh, efforts to do so as well, so I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I'd also add that uh, it is possible in certain, uh, under certain regimes to inject public support uh, sort of high, uh, further up into the uh, liability structure, so there would be more um, investor losses to absorb uh, the actual bank losses before you ever get to the public money. So, so I think there are lots of benefits and, and lots more risk being, being held not only by equity, but also by subordinated and even uh, senior debt uh, investors. So our ratings across uh, the liability structure um, have now, are now spanning as much as, as seven notches from the most junior to the most senior. And, uh, and in terms of, uh, uplift above the intrinsic financial strength sort of for the average rating in the uh, liability structure, you know, for a systemically important bank, we would typically give perhaps a one rating notch instead of the two to four I mentioned earlier. Thanks. Uh, Professor Book, let me ask you about, um, you know, it's interesting in your, uh, in your um, report, I see that um, for example, funding cost advantages were seen as um, lower in jurisdictions that have more fully implemented resolution reforms and capital ratios are higher for systemically important banks, even though there don't appear to be any material differences between um, those and, and, and other finance institutions. It would seem from reading the report, from, from looking through the evidence that in fact, uh, the situation is better, with the exception of bank profitability, um, for those for those regimes, for those jurisdictions that have implemented your reforms. Why don't they, Why don't more of them do it more quickly? Well, I guess um, one reason is I don't know 
the details about the regions, the jurisdictions that have done less. But obviously, I mean, this is a very complex political process. I mean, that we are really talking about when we talk about resolution reforms, we're, we're talking about new putting new institutions into place. I mean, in terms of the legal systems, in terms of the authorities that are there. So there's obviously a lot of things that needs to be need to be con considered. So um, what we do see is that the the um, home authorities of globally systemically important financial institutions, they have moved the most in terms of um, resolution re reform. So I guess that's also telling you that these are the countries that feel the need for it more urgently. So that certainly is an, is an issue. How, how urgent is it? How pressing is the issue? Then um, domestic political economy issues might also play a role. So there might just be other things which are higher up on the, on the, on the agenda. So we don't take a stance here. We just know that there are differences, and as I said, the FSB is working a lot on, on these um, on these issues. Um, I, let, let me just mention one issue because um, Richard very rightly said it's hard to do to really to to trace what we're observing, what we're observing in terms of changes in balance sheet structures of, of banks um, to the reforms or to specific reforms. So everybody who reads the report will notice that we're very careful to to argue about. Um, causation because a lot of reforms were put into place at the same time but I do see that we, we, we see correlations which are, which are fairly suggestive um, suggestive suggestive of uh, the reforms paying off in terms of enjoying the, the, the social costs and benefits and here I also fully agree with Richard that there's no hard number of how to measure this so we're also very careful to say there's a lot of indicators and putting them into into um, perspective looking at quantitative and qualitative indicators we do see that the reforms are paying off so in that sense the countries that haven't fully implemented maybe they're a bit more convinced by our report that it that it's paying off thank you dr canner when you look at the you, you observe no negative side effects as well when you look at um, institutions that have or jurisdictions that have implemented these reforms Although lower bank profitability must be one, as noted in the report, does that not affect your ratings? Well, uh, you know, some, some, many banks are experiencing low profitability, and there are many drivers uh, for that. Um, I don't, you know, we, it's hard to attribute how much is due to the uh, FSB uh, to big fail reforms. Um, the low profitability extends uh, to banking institutions that aren't even covered by those reforms as well. So uh, I think uh, it, it's, it is a broader problem. And it isn't to say that uh, some of the banks that have added uh, more expensive liabilities, for example, to their to their cap, capital structure, you know, don't have to bear that cost. They do. Um, but we, we haven't seen um, uh, a significant migration of uh, of credit and assets away from uh, large, uh, systemically important banks. We've seen some, and some, some, but it's not uh, dramatic, and it, it varies from from country to country. Uh, so I wouldn't say that uh, you know this is crushed. <laughs> There's no evidence that it's crushed uh, the, the systemically important banks. And when we talk with the banks about their profitability issues. This isn't actually the topics that they tend to raise. They tend to raise competition discussions about uh, cost structures, of course, about the low interest rates uh, environment and the, and the flatness of the, of the term structure of interest rates. So there's so many drivers of profitability. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I don't uh, have any reason to believe that this is a primary source of concern. And if it does, of course, lead to some withdrawal of capital or a reduction in the size of some banking industries in some countries, that could be a, a good thing where there's overcapacity. I'd say I've, I have the same. Uh, I have the same experience when I speak with with bank CEOs. They don't really mention um, TBTF reforms. I just brought it up because the report says bank profitability has fallen, reflect, reflecting changes in their capital structure and risk taking, and this is to be expected. On the other hand. Uh, down to a man every CEO I speak to, and unfortunately, um, I think with the exception of Santander, I've, I've only spoken to male CEOs. That's a that's a different uh, problem. Maybe diversity is a different panel, but they all mention 
um, rates as the big problem here. And I was thinking about that, Professor Buch, um, how difficult is it to, uh, to attribute observed outcomes to your reforms or lack thereof in a period of zero or negative interest rates and really unprecedented monetary policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm glad that we come back to this issue of, of profitability because like uh, Richard mentioned, there, there's so many aspects, drivers of bank profitability that it would be hard to say that, oh, it's just this one set of reforms that, that drives profitability clearly. And we haven't done, I mean, this wasn't the purpose of this study to, to look at all the different facets of it. But I yeah. think everything that has been mentioned is, is very important. So it's certainly competition plays a role. The um, the, the, the structure of the real economy, the growth potential in the real economy, we haven't discussed that, so that's also important. Um, obviously, also um, um, interest rates um, on markets are playing a role. And I think for this, for, for our view, it's, it's important that um, we can actually have situations where a decline in bank profitability is well consistent with a more resilient financial system. If we have higher equity capital in the system, then just by definition, return on equity falls if the banks take less risk, if their funding costs increase because we have less of an implicit funding subsidy through um, the, the bailout promise. Um, in, in all those instances, we would see uh, bank profitability falling, but that would be from a, from a social perspective, it would actually be good news. Although I fully understand bank managers and owners who would rather prefer uh, perhaps the opposite. But I think in the end, we all benefit from a, from a stable financial system. And I think as a final remark to the extent that low profitability is related to excessive capacity in the financial system, um, it's also something where, where um, the, the um, resolution reforms that have been implemented come, come into, into play because they should also enable exit. I mean, we, the one objective is that crisis and distress is less likely, but should it happen, then we should also have a mechanism uh, to allow for exit um, from, from banking markets. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may, Matt, I, I just wanted to uh, note that uh, we're in a low interest rate environment, so um, expected returns on equity are likely to be lower going forward as well. So, um, you know, some reduction in, 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 in returns are to be expected across all firms in the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, banking, yes, has, has, has not performed particularly well to date, but I mean, I don't think uh, we should be expecting uh, the return rates of return that we saw uh, more than a decade ago for the banking system in any case. Um, there is one area uh, I, would, I would like to see explored perhaps in the next report. Um, uh, when I was thinking about potential unintended consequences, um, uh, I, I was thinking about uh, the market dislocations that we saw in March uh, that uh, in the dash for cash, um, there were a lot of questions about how could securities, uh, you know, trade so out of line with their some fundamental values and uh, some uh, thoughts that, that perhaps um, the reforms, not just TPTF, but other banking system reforms may have uh, undermined the, uh, the role of banks at, at stabilizing those aspects of the market. Now, when I checked with some of my colleagues who follow this more closely, uh, they didn't attribute it to, to that. They, they, they attributed it more to the, um, the low interest rate and stable interest rate environment that we had for so long that reduced um, the amount of capital that was devoted to to, to those kinds of uh, uh, <clears throat> business activities of stabilizing, but uh, it's still a bit of an uncertain. I understand there's still some academic questions out, outstanding. So it would be an interesting area to explore whether um, dealer behavior has been adversely affected in some way by TVTF and, and, and use the March uh, cases as, as, a, as one to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I, I do, uh, I do recall hearing a lot of managers talk about the cost of um, supervision. I mean, the three aspects that these reforms follow is really ca capital buffers, right? En enhanced supervision and some sort of uh, resolution um, mechanism. And the, the second one results in compliance costs that have to be, at least if you're to believe uh, managers through the roof, uh, Richard, what do you think about that? And 
um, what additional uh, what additional kind of disclosures would 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 you like to see? Well, uh, compliance costs have increased. Um, I'm also in the last uh, 10, 12 years became part of a regulated firm, and I, I know what it is now to be highly regulated and, and, and some of the costs associated with that. Uh, I will say um, the costs are not only the financial costs of, of gathering all the materials and time, but there's a lot of senior management attention given to compliance. Uh, so the, in effect, the pain is felt very much at the top of the organization. So you'll hear a lot about it because it's so visible to senior management uh, because they're experiencing it, although it's hard to quantify um, the value of, the, of, of that time resource as opposed to the other more direct compliance costs. Now, in banking, it's a bit different. You have armies of people uh, working to prepare, not so much for the TBTF reforms, but for you know C card tests and, and, and the like. Uh, uh, so you know there is a very significant cost. I think I think uh, the test. Um, for uh, whether these costs are, are destabilizing um, is really the, is something that is discussed in the report and we discussed a little already, which is to what extent has uh, banking activities shipped out of the banking system? And uh, we haven't discussed it yet on the call too much, but uh, uh, I think uh, the shifts that we've observed um, have been uh, appropriate and, and don't have the uh, feeling to me that uh, the banking system is being stripped out of its core 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 activities and and uh, and risks are migrating in a significant way to the to the um, non-bank sector. In particular, we do see uh, you know, subprime origination, uh, you know, more questionable borrowers moving to uh, other types of intermediaries, uh, which I think is a healthy thing. It's not a huge volume. We've seen uh, problem loans moved off of the bank balance sheets into other vehicles, which is an appropriate place for them to manage manage them. And then thirdly, and most importantly, in, the, in terms of affecting the large aggregates, you know, we see more bond issuance and less bank loan issuance in, in some markets. Uh, I think those borrowers um, always had ready access to credit. They were just choosing between which venue to, to, to seek credit. And so I don't view that as a particular uh, concern uh, at all. I want to uh, start with some of the questions that we're getting from participants. Um, and Claudia, one of them is around an issue that another issue that I talk to a lot when I interview bank CEOs, and that is um, M&A. If the ECB is looking to clear obstacles um, to cross-border M&A, is there any conflict with that and uh, the too big to fail reforms that you've tried to put in place? Um, well, nothing, again, the report talks about directly. And of course we can't say anything about, you know, what are optimal strategies for being active across borders. So this is something that bank management owners have to decide. So I think what is, I mean, certainly a benefit um, of the entire reform package is that we now have globally agreed, agreed, agreed upon reforms, kind of a common framework for also dealing with banks that operate across borders. Um, so I, I fully um, understand the issue about compliance costs. I also see the point that, of course, I mean, if we want to improve reg regulation, that has also compliance issues and that may, may be costly. But um, overall, I would say that now banks have um, a much more con consistent system to, to operate across borders. So if anything, that shouldn't um, uh, um, increase the hurdles, but rather than through also uh, regulatory cooperation, it should lower hurdles. But again, this is not anything that we've looked at specifically. Um, so I can also I, I can I cannot refer to any particular um, analytical piece in this um, in this report. Um, maybe for a later day, we can we can just dis discuss to what extent regulation that that tries to be more aligned with risks and that that is also more um, more complex because of that um, has a trade-off um, in terms of on, on, on the one hand the, the, the more pre precise I want to be with regulation that's related to the, the compliance cost of course that's also increasing the cost of regulation but again this is not what we are discussing here um, in this in this study. Uh 
nonetheless, these are the kind of questions that we're getting. Um, and of course, as you both understand, I'm sure a lot of the questions that we've received are around uh, the issue of um, COVID-19 and its effect. As you stated at the beginning, you know, this, um, this period observed only until February. So uh, you didn't, you didn't uh, look at um, the pandemic's effect on, on banks or the, the effect didn't get into your analysis. On the other hand, it's partly due to the cushions that you've built up um, through these reforms that we haven't seen yet a financial crisis as the economic numbers shock us every day to the downside. We've seen some uh, jurisdictions loosen things up a little bit for banks in order to uh, um, make it easier for them to deal with and continue to issue credit. And I guess that's part of the um, the elasticity that you that you figured into the system. Uh, one of our viewers wants to know if the FSB wants to provide relief by changing the methodology of the GSIB score calculation this year. Well, I think that, I mean, this is really important that we understand, I mean, what the, the let me call it the regulatory, regulatory relief that has been granted in the context of the crisis. As I said, it's, it's fiscal policy, monetary policy, regulator. So we're so everybody has tried to to mitigate the impact of the of the shock, but clearly this is not um, a, a kind of the, the the start to a big deregulation. And we have a lot of structural features in the financial system and the banking system that haven't changed and that need to be properly addressed by regulation. So I wouldn't say this is that that this is kind of um, the, the the starting point of, of deregulation and reconsidering um, um, how regulation is being designed, but it's using the flexibility which is in in the system and um, which is now proving to be uh, to be very um, beneficial. Um, maybe briefly on this on this point that how much can we learn from the March experience? Um, I think it's, it's it's going to be very useful and interesting um, event, but. Um, I wonder how much we can generalize from this situation, which is really so unprecedented. So we hardly had in our lifetime a global shock that was hitting all countries um, to, to that in intensity. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of research will be done, but I would question a bit to what extent we can learn this. Um, we, we can generalize from, from that event um, uh, to how the system is, is, is working in, in more normal times. But that's up for discussion, obviously. Thank you. Um, so. We've talked about uh, a little bit about the capital buffers then. We've talked a little bit about the oversight. The third one is the resolution mechanism. And Richard, I wonder, you know, although we hope we don't have to see these kind of mechanisms uh, enacted as we head into this crisis, do you feel um, that investors have enough information, that creditors have enough information about how losses would be allocated, how the resolution mechanism would work? Well, I think the process, you know, um, is enhanced the more information the investors have um, so that, you know, they have a better idea of what's, you know, what's at risk for them and what's not. And so um, they don't, uh, as a group, move away from uh, a part of a liability structure that's really well protected. Uh, and if they are uh, concerned about a bank, they can also send that through a market signal through pricing. So I think it's really great to have um, as much uh, information in the market as possible. At present, uh, particularly for institutions that cut across uh, multiple bound national boundaries, for a uh, multi-country, systemically important bank, limited information available to investors. Um, we don't have, in, in many cases, a clear articulation of the resolution strategy for the banking group, which is, you know, which subsidiaries will be subjected to resolution tools, you know, what would be the scope of each resolution group, what are the material legal entities, and what are the non-material legal entities, you know, you know, would we, you know, liquidate or try to sell the non-material ones? So there's a lot of detail. Some of that may be considered proprietary information and, and it could not be shared, but some of it Maybe, maybe something that, that could be shared. And then um, if there's going to be a single point of entry, I think the regulators have done a great job in the last few years of thinking about the realities of, of cross-border cooperation among regulators uh, uh, and how they're going to get comfortable with uh, protecting 
uh, effectively the, the liabilities in, in their own jurisdiction uh, and, and yet, you know, allow excess capital when it's available to be transferred to um, a home country uh, to, to help in its resolution. So there's a lot of great work going on about, uh, as, you know, establishing prepositioning internal um, loss absorbing capital. Uh, and so that uh, there'll be a, a well considered approach to resolving a uh, multinational uh, institution, but that information really isn't you know fully shared with the marketplace. So you know more information about uh, prepositioned uh, uh, loss absorbing internal uh, TLAC uh, would be, would be really really helpful. And uh, similarly, when there are groups that are going to be subjected to multiple points of, of entry, we're going to need to know um, you know what are the expectations at each of the each of those uh, subsidiaries. So there's a lot of detail there. Um, you know, yet we don't necessarily need to know all that detail to have some confidence that uh, um, under the right circumstances, authorities will uh, effectively resolve these institutions. But to understand each investment standing and each place in the liability structure internationally, we need quite a bit more information. That's actually, you know, I, I was going to ask Claudia what more um, she thinks needs to be done, and I'll allow her, uh, Richard, to respond to you in that answer as well. Professor Booth, what um, what do you see uh, after this 137-page um, analysis that still needs to be done, and does and does it include yes. what Richard was was asking? Yes. Yeah. So these are really the key things that Richard also mentioned. So the first we talked about it's um, completing the implementation of resolution reforms, closing the gaps, making sure that the system is working. It's not about redesigning everything, but it's it's uh, taking what we have, looking at it, seeing where there are gaps. Um, so that's the, that's the first key item. The second key item is this whole spectrum of information and transparency that, that Richard mentioned. So that's a very clear message um, we had the same problem that um, he mentioned about understanding who are the holders of TLEC, so this bail-in capital. Of course, it's crucially important to price these um, debt securities, but it's also crucially important for the resolution authorities if they at any point in time in the future have to decide um, which resolution tool to, to use. They have to understand the, the, the structure of TLEC holders. And we, interestingly, for those um, um, of you from, from Europe listening, uh, we actually had good information, relatively good information um, on, on those TLEC holdings from European jurisdictions. Other jurisdictions have different types of data sets or it's, it's more difficult to get that um, information. So clearly closing well, I wouldn't say closing the information gaps in terms of collecting more information necessarily, but deciding um, what information do we have already, to what extent can we share it. Clearly, there's a, there's a trade-off um, when we talk about transparency, um, but I think we can still do more in terms of um, improving information systems uh, for the benefit um, of all of us. Um, internal TLAC has been, has been mentioned. Um, we actually had also we didn't get any data information on this internal TLEC, um, but we 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 are strongly convinced that it's a it's a very important coordination um, device, and it's 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 also making sure that the whole system is working uh, much better. The third area is monitoring. Is um, we haven't much discussed um, domestically systemically important banks, so much more difficult to get consistent cross country information on those institutions. And also the issue of non-bank financial intermediation has been mentioned. So it's it's clearly positive in terms of more diversification in the system. If we have other providers of of, um, um, of credit to, uh, to the real economy, to the extent the larger banks, the more systemic banks are withdrawing. But of course, that also means risk migration, and we have to be aware of where the risks are going and and um, what it does to the to the system. So those three things: closing the gaps, um, improving. Uh, transparency information system and monitoring so these are really um, the things that are that re remain on our agenda although we've achieved a lot but um, um, there's also always work that needs to be done absolutely I, I think it's a uh, it's a great note to end on fortunately we don't have time it's 
obviously an extremely complex issue. Um, the report is very long, but I agree with Richard that I think it was really well uh, well executed and, and balanced. Um, Clear-eyed, I think, is, is the term that Richard used, and I have to agree. It's also fascinating to me as someone who watches these financial markets and you know, over the last decade, I hear mostly the argument from investors and executives, um, sometimes unhappiness about profitability kind of uh, kind of makes the biggest headlines. But in a time like this, when all of the questions that I see screaming down my screen are about um, COVID-19, um, you realize that the work that you've done, Professor Book and, and, and the FSB has really um, has really been a, a a blessing of sorts because we haven't seen the bottom fall out of the financial uh, industry at a time when we're seeing numbers, you know, PMIs and, and retail numbers and consumer confidence just drop through the floor much worse than they were in 2008, 2009. And I think a lot of people, I think this report will give people the chance to, to reflect on that. Richard, of course, um, the work that you do at Moody's also is very helpful to keeping this uh, financial system stable and uh, I appreciate both of you participating in this talk with us uh, Claudia Book and Richard Canner thanks very much thank you thanks for listening thank you Matt